Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. I'm Paul Ms. Packwell. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, a program where we bring you the writings of the church. And we are still on the document Fides et Ratio, which is an encyclical by Blessed John Paul II. Now, you can get a paperback copy of Fides et Ratio from EWTN's religious catalog. Just go to EWTNreligiouscatalog.com or you can call 1-800-854-6316 and order a paperback copy. Or if you'd like a free electronic copy of Fides et Ratio, you can go to the document library of our website, EWTN.com. Click on the Faith tab, and you'll see Document Library. Click that on, type in Fides et Ratio. Document will come right up. You can highlight it and download it into your computer. Now, we will, of course, like for you to be involved and participate in our show. One way to do that is to come here to Birmingham and be part of our live studio audience. Another way is to send us your question by writing to Threshold at EWTN.com and we'll try to answer as many of those questions as we can. Now, we were starting to go through the history of the early church where Blessed John Paul was describing some of the earliest Christian theologians who were also philosophers and how they began the process of using philosophy in the way they thought about the gospel and how Christ and the gospel were the basis, but philosophy was a set of tools they frequently brought with them from their lives before they were converted, as in the case of Justin Martyr, and then used it. Now, we're going to go to another stage in this history. In paragraph 40, we begin today, where he speaks about the work of Christianizing Platonic and Neoplatonic thought. Now, Platonic thought refers to the ideas and writings of Plato. And again, if you go online, you won't get them at our website, I don't think, but you can find all of the dialogues of Plato online. But as the centuries developed, other philosophers started with Plato and wrote their own books. And that later development was called Neoplatonism, which is simply the Greek word for New Platonism. And one of the most important individuals for that was a, a, a writer in Greek from Alexandria named Plotinus, P-L-O-T-I-N-U-S. And you can probably get his writings also online if you are interested. Now, here we see that a number of theologians used Platonic and Neoplatonic thought. Among them were the Cappadocian Fathers. Now, Cappadocia is an area of eastern Turkey today. And the three Cappadocian Fathers were Saint Basil, Saint Gregory Nazianzen, and Saint Gregory of Nyssa. Those three. Absolutely key and wonderful theologians, all of whom are in our document library as well. You can download any of their writings. Another theologian was Dionysius the Areopagite. Now, that's his name was probably Dionysius. We, we, we don't know for sure. But he was not the Areopagite. Areopagite means the man from the Areopagus. The Areopagus 
is a big rock at the base of the hill of the Parthenon. And it was a place where you could discuss anything. All topics were free to discuss with impunity. So a lot of people held debates there. And St. Paul was one of them in Acts 17. And it says in Acts that not many believed him except Dionysius. And so somebody either names Dionysius or took the name Dionysius, um, you know, wrote some materials using the thought of the uh, Platonists. And then the last one who is extremely important, the, the most important theologian in the history of the church, namely St. Augustine. Now, St. Augustine was not very good at Greek, but he did study Plotinus and the Neoplatonists, and they had a huge impact on his thought as part of the process of him thinking his way to being a Christian. But he also says in his Confessions that the basis was Christ, the Platonists were somebody that he just used. Now, why do I call him the great, uh, the Pope called him the great doctor of the West, Augustine? Why do I call him the greatest? You know, I would accept that St. Thomas Aquinas took whole new levels farther than Augustine in so many ways. I don't deny that. But St. Augustine was doing philosophy or doing theology 800 years before Thomas. And that 800 years of influence was absolutely crucial as a preparation upon which Thomas could build. So, so we'll get to Thomas later. But now just realize that St. Augustine had come into contact with different philosophical schools, but all of them left him disappointed. He tried, he belonged to a cult for quite a number of years. And he found out when he met their leader that they were dumber than a box of rocks. They were just plain stupid. And they didn't know what they were talking about. So that disillusioned him. He tried Cicero, but was left with cynicism. And then he went to the, the, the Neoplatonists. It was only when he encountered the truth of Christian faith that he found the strength to undergo a radical conversion. He had a lot of problems. He was what we would call today sexually addicted. He had you know, a number of girlfriends. Finally, he shacked up with one woman for 14 years. And then when, uh, uh, but didn't marry her. And when a marriage was proposed, he sent her packing, sent her away, and then couldn't stay away from the loose women of the day. And he said he just couldn't stop himself. You know, so he had a, a real problem with that. And that conversion, a moral conversion, was something he was not able to undergo until he became a Christian. And he, uh, he talks about this in his Confessions, in Book 6. By the way, the Confessions, I want to give you the same advice. Sister Ida gave our class in eighth grade. Do not die without reading the Confessions of St. Augustine. Get the paperback, which is easily available, or go to our website and download it. It's there. But don't die without reading the Confessions. It's one of the most important books in the history of Europe and the world after the Bible. So in book 6, chapter 5, uh, it says, Being led, however, from this philosophy to prefer the Catholic doctrine, I felt that her proceeding was more unassuming and honest in that 
she, that is the church, required to be believed, things not demonstrated. In other words, that they could in themselves be demonstrated, but not to certain persons, or could not at all be demonstrated. Whereas among the Manichees, that was the cult that he belonged to, uh, our credulity was mocked by a promise of certain knowledge. See, this Manichee said, we don't give you faith. You will know yourself for sure these things. And the church says, no, you're going to accept this on faith. And then so many most fabulous and absurd things were imposed to be believed because they could not be demonstrated. So he said, this is the difference between the Manichees and the Christians. The Manichees, who believed that the evil God of the Old Testament created matter, and the good God of the New Testament created spirit. It was a Gnostic group in, in many ways. Um, he said, um, this is where the Catholic faith is better. Because they tell you, very humbly, this is accepted on faith. The Medicaid say, oh no, you'll know this for sure. But then everything they propose, you can't prove. And they couldn't prove. That's why I realized how dumb they were. They just couldn't prove anything, even though they said it was knowledge, not faith. So they expected you to believe more, you know, totally absurd things while claiming that you'd have knowledge of it, and you couldn't. So, in other words, he realized they were totally false in what they taught. So, though uh, Augustine accorded the Platonists a place of privilege, Again, he had tried Cicero, and as a matter of fact, it's interesting. He describes in the, in the uh, Confessions how he began to read Cicero only to learn the style. He was called, he was studying to be a rhetor, that is, someone who knew rhetoric. And it didn't matter about the content. It was the rhetoric that counted. And if you could win an argument, whether it was true or not, you could make a living. We have people like that today. I'll pass over the lawyers and the politicians in silence. But, I'll be that as it may. By the way, that was one of Cicero's tricks, to say, I will pass over these people I disagree with and their wrong ideas in silence, which, of course, he just mentioned. Um, but he, but uh, Augustine was stuck, struck by something. It's not just the fantastic Latin style of Cicero, but there was some real content there, and that got him starting to think and uh, to, to realize even rhetoric is a good tool, but you must have the truth when you use rhetoric and not just use rhetoric to convince people of things that are not true. Very important. So at any rate, uh, he tried uh, Cicero, but then he said the Platonists were far superior. But as good a, philosopher, a group of philosophers as he found the Platonists, he rebuked them because knowing the goal to seek. They ignored the path that leads to it, namely the Word made flesh. They didn't realize that Christ is that Word that leads them to the goal of eternal life. And they knew that was the goal, but they, Platonism could not tell you how to attain eternal life. So Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo, succeeded in producing the first great synthesis of philosophy and theology. And that's one of the most important keys about him. He pulled them together in a whole new way. That's why his thought dominates the theology all the way up until St. Thomas. And even then, St. Thomas used Augustine more than any other theologian you know, for his work. He embraced the currents of thought, both in Greek and Latin uh, thinkers. 
And he saw the great unity of knowledge that was grounded in the thought of the Bible. And that this unity of knowledge in Scripture and philosophy was itself confirmed and sustained by a depth of speculative thinking. He would tackle problems with the fantastic mind God had given him and the training that he had. And he would come to new deep ideas that we do well to keep studying today. The synthesis devised by St. Augustine remained for centuries the most exalted form of philosophy and theology known to the West. And this was extremely important. Remember, he died when the Vandals had surrounded the city walls of Hippo. And some months after his death, they conquered Hippo. And it was some of the priests who were able to get his books out of there before the Vandals destroyed everything. But that was just the beginning. It was going to be for the next 200 years that Western Europe was going to be uh, overrun by one group of vandals after, uh, of uh, barbarians after another. The Visigoths had conquered, had sacked Rome tw uh, 10 years before, no, 20 years before the vandals came to Hippo. And then later on, the Ostrogoths came, and the Lombards, and the Gepids. You ever hear the Gepids? No, but they came too. The Burgundians, the Franks, the Alemanni, the Bavarians, all these groups that happen to be the ancestors of most of us from European background. All these barbarians came through. And the thought of Augustine and his ability to synthesize philosophy and theology became the way by which these barbarians eventually became civilized thinkers. And he is one of the most important influences in what became European thought. So uh, that's why it's important to read Augustine. And when people like Matthew Fox, formerly a Dominican priest and formerly a Catholic he left the church and all, uh, when he says that Augustine was the biggest problem there ever was, I say, read more Augustine. The more that people like Fox tell you not to read it, that's a good indicator. This is a good book, and the, he's not speaking for God's side. You know, so go ahead and read. Believe Sister Ida, not former uh, Dominican Fox. So, um, and this whole idea, the synthesis, of philosophy and theology was reinforced by his life because his confessions showed that knowing the truth of faith and philosophy changes lives. It changed his life and made him a completely different person um, for the better. And so people said, yeah, the truth of what he says rings in the way he describes his life. And he was able to introduce a wide range of material into his writings. He drew on a lot of experience and developed currents of philosophy and other thought. He brought that together. Now, paragraph 41, the ways in which the fathers of the East and West engaged the philosophical schools were therefore quite different. So the way that they used philosophy in the East and in the West were different because they, they read different philosophers and different approaches. Uh, even language, the difference between Latin and Greek made a difference because of the kind of vocabulary available to each. But this does not mean that they identified the content of their message with the philosophical systems that's also true. They didn't say, look, I'm a Platonist before I'm a Christian. Just the opposite. They were Christians before they were Platonists. That was, they judged Plato by Christ 
They did not judge Christ by Plato. Very important distinction. So he brings up uh, the question of the North African uh, Latin writer Tertullian. He was a layman. And he wrote one book, De Prescriptione Hereticorum. Uh, in book nine, chapter uh, book seven, chapter nine, and he was said, "What indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What concord is there between the academy and the church?" Now, Tertullian is saying that Athens, which is where philosophy got started, and Jerusalem, where Christ died, have nothing in common. He took that approach. And there are Christians today who still take that approach. But uh, that was saying too much, but at least this much is true. Tertullian shows that there is a critical consciousness with which Christian thinkers first confronted the problem of the relationship between faith and philosophy. So Tertullian is saying, ah, Basically, his question was rhetorical. There should be nothing to do between philosophy and Athens versus Jerusalem and Jesus uh, and the Bible. And instead, uh, as you know, they, they looked, not, not just taking any philosophy that comes along, but they looked at the positive aspects of philosophy and the limitations. And that's very important. Uh, the early Christians were not naive thinkers at all. They were very sophisticated. You read St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil, St. Augustine. They were very sophisticated thinkers. And precisely because they were intense in living the content of the faith, they took the faith as something, not just as an idea, but the faith was a way of life you live. And um, then they were able to reach the deepest forms of speculation and solve a lot of problems in life that the pagans could not. So it is therefore minimalizing and mistaken to restrict the work of the fathers simply to the transposition of the truths of faith into philosophy categories. In other words, see that, and why does he say that? There are some people who try to say, oh, the only thing the fathers did was take some Bible ideas, decorate it with Greek philosophy, and represent it. That is only something you can say if you don't read the fathers yourself and read them carefully. They really thought through the issues carefully. They were good thinkers. And that's one of the reasons why we can learn some greater depth of thought when we go to look at them. And they did much more than just mix and match. It wasn't Mr. Potato Head approach. I'll take a little bit of Bible, a little bit of philosophy, and I'll put a philosophy ear on the Bible potato. No, no, no. No, no, no. They did much more. In fact, they succeeded in disclosing completely all that remained implicit in the thinking of the great philosophers. So uh, the philosophers had good ideas. They were still just the beginnings. Christ completed the good ideas of the philosophers. Instead, theirs was the task of showing how reason can be freed from external constraints that were the limits of philosophy. They could go far beyond that and that they could find their way out of the blind alley of mythology. Mythology just led to these blind alleys and ab uh, rabbit runs that don't get you anywhere. So you know, that was something that didn't help at all. And the Greeks tried, but they just said, no, this goes nowhere. 
Instead, the fathers were able to show and open themselves to the transcendent God in a more appropriate way. That God who's beyond all limits. We, again, I've said in past weeks that Greek philosophy was attached to mythology. And the mythologies of the gods are of these nasty people. The gods are very jealous. You know, they'll, and then they'll, because they're upset with each other and they can't die, what they do is they instigate people to die and cause wars and get in trouble or get raped and things like that. So these are nasty people, whereas God is not just one personality among others. I had one uh, atheist say, well, you've gotten rid of all the mythology gods. You just need to get rid of one more god and then you'll be free like me. I said, no, I'll be dumb like you because God is beyond the universe itself and opens up the way beyond the universe. Instead, what happens is that we, our minds become purified and rightly tuned. And reason is able to go to higher levels of thought and give a basis, a solid foundation for being able to examine the nature of being, what exists while we're here, the purpose of life. God gives us a basis for that, to see what is beyond all the limits, even of the universe and to go to the absolute truth, who is God that created everything that exists and permeates everything. And that vision of God is what the fathers accomplished. They were able to welcome reason, give the absolute, and give it new richness from revelation. They were able to meet the cultures of Israel and its faith with the cultures of the Greeks. And they were able to do this in the depths of human souls so that God the Creator engages and meets the creature. And they go way beyond nature, way beyond what's there. And no matter how many philosophies the fathers were faced with, they looked at those elements that fit God's self-revelation, what we see in Scripture. They recognized where they came together, but they didn't ignore where they go apart. They put God at the center, and they found depths of truth that none of the philosophers were capable of finding. And today, we seek the same. All right, we're going to take a break and come back and get some questions and emails and see what else we can learn. Thank you. First of all, I want to invite you to come here to EWTN if you get a chance. If you're passing through Birmingham or make it a destination, please uh, do come and spend some time with us. Uh, come to our masses and, of course, to the programs. We just ask that you contact our pilgrimage department so they know you're coming, whether as individuals or families or big parish groups. We love to have them come too. And you can... Um, uh, call Pilgrimage at 205-271-2966 or go to www.ewtn.com. 
Also, we want to recommend that you take a look at EWTN's religious catalog for some great Christmas gifts. As you know, I'll be spending Christmas Eve and Christmas uh, in the Holy Land. And if you can't come with us, then you can also take a look at my book, The Holy Land, An Armchair Pilgrimage. And that'll give you a lot of the sights uh, of the Holy Land and some meditations on what Jesus did at those sites. So we urge that. And then another option is uh, the Truth and Life Dramatized Audio Bible. And we have that for the New Testament. We don't have the Old Testament yet, but we've got the New Testament. And the you know, actors uh, do the different voices, and you, you get a, a new kind of liveliness from taking a look at that. So I, I strongly recommend it. Uh, again, you go to EWTNReligiousCatalog.com and see a lot more stuff, too. Or you can call one 800 854-6316. All right, we're going to start off with a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Uh, I'm from New Orleans. For good, the, for the good to have you here. And your question. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the Jews and Roman governors saw Jesus as another prophet. Do you think any of them, after hearing him speak, would have thought that he was just another philosopher? Okay. Here, he would be uh, something else. Um, you know, you actually had quite a mixture of Jewish reaction to Jesus. Uh, namely, that uh, some thought he was a prophet. And you see that mentioned. But others didn't. And reject him and, said, and considered him a false prophet. That's why they say at the cross, a lot of words mocking him. He saved others, let him save himself. Things like that. Even the other thief, you know, the thieves were divided uh, on that issue. So you have to keep in mind that mixture, and you still would see a good deal of such mixture. And in general, um, most Jewish people over the centuries, including today, would not consider him a prophet. Um, if you get a chance to read Pope Benedict's book, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, in the first volume, he quotes one of the really great rabbinic scholars, uh, modern rabbinic scholars, uh, Jacob Neusner. And no he, he cites Neusner, who says, you know, so many great things are said by Jesus, but what we Jews cannot accept is the claims to be the Lord of the Sabbath and all the claims. I mean, the way Jewish people reacted in the gospel is still the reaction, which is why they don't believe in him. They, they react against him on that part, and they don't like his teaching about who he is. Uh, so that'd be one thing. And they would not accept him as a philosopher if they take that. For the Jews, it's either an imposter or a messiah. Okay, that's, that's their choice. Among, you know, you see the Romans, for instance, you see the reaction. I mentioned uh, Pilate being a good example. He's um, bemused by all this. He recognizes that this is an issue between the high priests and Jesus it has nothing to do with the Roman Empire. And that's all he cares about. Uh, and that's why he makes that very cynical statement, what is truth? You know, he doesn't care. Um, you might have some Greeks consider Jesus a philosopher, but, you know, um, in last week's show, one of the things I pointed out is how Celsus, a Roman philo philosopher, a Greek, me, a Greek philosopher, had said, these Christians are all ignorant, they're stupid, and they're from, they, they don't know anything. So he, you don't see 
that reaction of considering Jesus a philosopher until after somebody becomes converted. Then they'll look at him that way, but not before. They, they didn't see that. Okay. All right, let's start off. Let's go to another email. Dear Father, would you please clarify a common misunderstanding that Our Lady was an unwed mother when she conceived Jesus? The term betrothed is misunderstood as being engaged when actually its meaning is to be married. Our Lady and St. Joseph were married when Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Sharon in St. Charles, Missouri. Very good issue to bring up at this time of year, uh, getting very close to Christmas. And I've heard this. As a matter of fact, I remember a flurry that was big enough to get into Time, Time and or Newsweek back in the 1970s when a uh, rather uh, foolish nun who was a professor at a Catholic university wrote that Mary was an unwed mother. She added that she uh, that, that Mary had been raped by a Roman soldier and that he was the real father of Jesus. And then they asked her, why are you teaching that? She says, well, I have a lot of women in my class who are unwed mothers, and many of them have been raped too. So they are better able to relate to Mary if they see her as an unwed mother who's been raped. Well, okay. So um, if you are working with a group at a high security prison, are you going to describe Jesus as a murderer? Because they're murderers and they can relate to it? Or are you going to des describe, um, you know, Peter, James, and John as thieves because they're thieves and they can better relate to them? I hope not. That is and was a very dumb approach to history. You don't try false relationships to your audience as a basis for telling something unless you're running for political office, then you might. But if you're an honest person who tells what you really are like, you tell the truth. Now, the story of Mary being raped by a Roman soldier is actually derived from the Talmud. But it was, that was written sometime in the 4th or 5th century. And not even the Mishnah, which is second century, has any such story. And this nun just put that in there. She didn't make it up. She just took it out of the Talmud and said, oh, this is probably true. On what basis? If you believe that, you need, oh, well, she already gave up the veil, but leave the convent, leave the church. That is not Catholicism. And, T and, and Sharon is absolutely correct. You, it's not um, the, the right way to look as if she were engaged and then got pregnant. Because the betrothal was a commitment beyond what we talk about as engagement. For that reason, St. Joseph spoke about getting a divorce when he found out. Remember that? In Matthew chapter 1. He went to divorce her quietly because he didn't just say, I'm going to break off the engagement. He had a divorce. It was a more formal ceremony. And he could have had her stoned you know, for adultery. But an angel told him that it was Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, not by a Roman soldier and not to an unwed mother. He took her in and became the foster father. Okay. All right. 
You have another question? Ma'am, where are you from? I'm also from New Orleans. Are you with this gentleman? Yes, I am for oh. 35 years. So, he, <laughs> so he's your faithful sidekick. <laughs> yes. uh, my question is, we've been the beneficiary of such great encyclicals in modern times from these popes. They're so deep, they're so rich, there's, there's history, uh, theology. Do they do this by themselves or have an editorial team helping them? Because I don't know where they'd find the time. Right. Um, overall, uh, they write these things themselves, okay? They do consult with various experts. Uh, just you know to check through things. And for instance, um, I know in some of the encyclicals, there were footnotes that were written by some of the professors from the Gregorian University, from the Biblicum and other universities, that they would say, you know, uh, check on this Hebrew word and its connection with the Aramaic and all that other stuff. And they'll do that. But, uh, and they'll become a footnote, but they write the, the text. Um, as a young priest, uh, Karavoitiwa would get a piece of paper and pencil and write before, while well, he sat before the Blessed Sacrament. Later on, uh, he got a pen, and still later as a bishop, he got a typewriter. And then as Pope, he even got a uh, laptop and, and wrote. And he, um, you know, did his writing before our Lord. As a matter of fact, uh, back in 2002, uh, I was doing some video documentaries in Poland, and we got to go to the uh, uh, Archbishop's Palace. And the table and chair where John Paul sat is still there in the Archbishop's Chapel. And, you know, it was uh, really an impressive thing to have to sit there and know that this is where he wrote. He wrote for our Lord, before our Lord. That was his goal. All right, we have here another uh, email. Dear Father Paco, you've been speaking about the principle of non-contradiction. Now recall this is from some weeks ago, and that's the principle that you cannot say that something is a certain thing and at the same moment is not that thing. So I can't say that I am a human being and at the same moment, I am not a human being. That would be contradictory. So you can't do that. So that's what you mean by the principle of non-contradiction. I definitely agree with you in the church, but I cannot seem to explain the principle when it comes to Jesus, who is both God and man. It seems to be a contradiction of the non-contradiction principle. Tim in Payson, Arizona. Well, here's one of the things that you're dealing with. It's not an application of the principle of non-contradiction. What is revealed in the scripture is that Jesus is God from all eternity. And then he became flesh and took on a full human nature. That the divine nature does not negate or contradict human nature. But Christ joins the two in such a way that neither nature is compromised. He remains fully human. And you see in the uh, councils that come, especially a little bit later, that that means he has a human soul a human will as well as the divine will, and that one does not replace the other. So he has both. And in this way, you know, I, I don't want to use the analogy of a sandwich because that's not unified enough, you know, to, to, to see, uh, because, you know, the um, unity of the divine nature and the human nature even gets 
a special Greek term called the hypostatic union. And so there's a true union of the two, but again, without destruction of either one. And it's, you know, it certainly is a, a mystery, but not a contradiction, all right? And, you know, that's one of the things that Christ very much tries to demonstrate, is that he has both natures. Uh, in John's Gospel, this great example, you, know, you see the clearest and strongest statements about Christ's divinity, but you also see some of many of his most human moments, as for instance, when he wept at the tomb of Lazarus. So, you know, both of those are present and necessary. We'll get to that in another time about the necessity. Another email. Dear Father Mitch, a couple days ago, I heard a guest on Marcus Grody's Journey Home show say that many Catholics are guilty unknowingly of worshiping Mary instead of properly venerating Mary. Can you provide some examples of how Catholics might be uh, improperly honoring Mary? Is it possible to love Mary too much? I'm just wondering if there are any simple rules that can help us distinguish between latria, which is, in fact, the word worship. That's where we get the word idolatry, you know, from latria, versus hyperdulia. Dulia is honoring. Hyperdulia is the extra kind of honoring we show the Blessed Mother in that we do this in our thoughts, words, deeds, or emotions. Thank you, Chris, in Austin, Texas. You know, um, I don't want to impugn specific individuals, uh, but I will mention uh, uh, an example of those who might worship Mary, were um, certain people who followed the writings of Carl Gustav Jung, a Swiss psychologist. And Jung didn't like the Blessed Trinity. Now, he was the son of a Protestant minister, Swiss Reform minister. And he was made First Communion, Confirmation, all that. But he didn't like the Trinity, he thought it was too unbalanced. So he added the Blessed Virgin Mary as the fourth person of the Trinity. However, uh, and that, by the way, you can see that in uh, the, 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 toward the end of his book, Answer to Job, also, you can see it in volume nine of his collected works. Uh, that volume is called Aeon, A-I-O-N. And he also s states, that Satan is the fourth person of the Blessed Trinity uh, in, in his book on Job. Now, this is what I would call thorough confusion because then you no longer have a Trinity. But if Satan is the fourth person and Mary is the fourth person, is he saying that Mary is Satan? I mean, this is silly talk. And, uh, and of course, at that pr point, you're talking about a quaternity, or in his case, perhaps a quintinity instead of a trinity, where there are five persons. Um, that would be going overboard. Okay? Um, and he, he said that the Catholics made Mary the fourth person of the trinity when Pope Pius XII declared the assumption of Mary. In 1950. Now that's not, it's not what the Pope said, it's not what the Pope means, it's not what the Catholic Church teaches. And anybody who goes along with such a foolish notion uh, would be going into Latria, okay? Uh, Latria. So um, that would be an example. Or if in personal devotions a person 
so focuses on Mary that they don't even incorporate faith in Jesus Christ and his salvation into the faith. That would be overdoing it, okay? So that would be an example, okay? And again, the, the basic rules uh, for this are to keep everybody in balance. Jesus is the center. We don't have Jesus without his conception in the womb of Mary. So we need her in the history of salvation. And what I would add, read chapter 8 of Lumen Gentium, the Constitution on the Church. That lays out our Marian devotion very well. And uh, sometime uh, early next year, uh, I'll be coming up with a new book uh, on the Virgin Mary, another Bible study for Catholics, and integrating what the Bible says with Lumen Gentium. So I recommend that. All right, I have another email here. Uh, Father Mitch, it seems many prayers on our Catholic faith mention the hour of our death. In particular, the St. Michael Chapel says, then the hour of our death, let none of our enemies approach to harm us. What exactly does this mean? What enemies? Are they demons? What exactly happens at the hour of our death? Except, of course, dying. This is from Joanne. 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 I've got very limited knowledge of what happens at the moment of death. I haven't tried it yet. So someday I will. But, you know, I have spoken to hospice nurses. Very interesting. They see a lot of dying people. And they do speak about people who have no faith and who experience right at the end this moment of terror. Whereas people of faith who do have a great peace as they die. And this is something that uh, it seems for those outside of faith that they can be attacked by demonic forces who are preparing them for hell. So that's one of the things that we want to be prepared for. Uh, we want at the, that last moment to be ready to go to God and not to the other side. All right, finally, uh, dear Father Mitch, in John's Gospel, when Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene after his resurrection, he tells her not to touch him. My friends and I wonder why. Can you explain this? Dorothy in Albany, New York. Sure, Dorothy, it's simple. The word that is used by John is not the word touch. That word is used when Jesus tells Thomas to touch his wounds in his hands, feet, and side. But the word that's used when Mary Magdalene is there is that she clings to him. She's grabbing onto him. She doesn't want to let him go. Whereas Jesus let Thomas touch him for proof that he uh, was really raised from the dead. She wanted to hang on. She said, you can't hang on. I must go to my father. And so you go back to it. You can't hang on to me. Heaven will be together forever. And also, just real quickly, on a recent threshold show, you define the term doctor of the church. It sounds like blessed John Paul the Great would qualify to be a doctor of the church. What is the process that would be followed to name himself? There'll be an examination of all his writings and see how over time they get used by Christians. And later on, some pope will go along and declare him officially a doctor of the church. Uh, so that's how they'll do that. All right. I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a wonderful time with your families and a time of coming closer to Jesus. That's the purpose of this season. Not to save the economy, but to be saved by Jesus. And may the Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And again, please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. Because, of course, we have a lot of bills to pay ourselves. And it's your support that keeps us going. This truly is your network, always has been.
and we appreciate the support you give us. God bless you. Thank you.